good evening. My name is Katie Bramel, and I am the Director of Museum Experiences here at the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center. And on behalf of our board, our staff, and volunteers, I would like to welcome you to tonight's virtual happy hour with the women of Uncle Nearest. Um, before we get started, I would also just like to give a quick shout out to our members and thank them for their support and to all who have supported us, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it is because support from support from you that we have been able to provide our wonderful programming initiatives, such as the discussion you're about to see tonight. Um, so at this time, I would like to go ahead and take a moment to introduce you to the women that I have the pleasure of speaking with tonight. So for this virtual discussion regarding the history of Uncle Nearest, we are fortunate enough to be joined with Victoria Edie Butler, who is the great granddaughter, great great granddaughter of Uncle Nearest, the first African-American master distiller on record um, and the namesake to Uncle Nearest. Um, she is the first known female African-American master blender and she oversees the blending process of Uncle Nearest 1884 small batch whiskey, as well as the selection of all 1820 single barrels. Butler also serves as a member of Uncle Nearest executive team and oversees the Nearest Green Foundation a 501c3 nonprofit organization that provides scholarships to nearest green descendants that is funded in part by the sales of Uncle Nearest Whiskey. We are also going to be joined tonight by Ronica Dillingham, who serves as the market manager for Ohio sales of Uncle Nearest Premium Whiskey, and Aaron Fox of Foxtails. So to kick things off with you tonight, um, some people, uh, we had some cocktail kits available um, and if you don't have a cocktail kit, we still have some ingredients that are going to make a really, I think, fun and enjoyable cocktail for tonight's discussion. And Erin is going to go ahead and lead us through that curated cocktail and teach you guys how to make it. Awesome. Thanks, Katie. I'm so excited to be here with all you ladies tonight and gentlemen, whoever is joining us. Um, it was nice to see you all today at the lodge picking up your cocktail kits. I'm excited to uh, tell you how to make this cocktail. Um, so in our kit, we had the um, house juice sour mix, and then we had the cherry maple um, syrup simple, and then I put together a smoked bitters for us, and then of course our um, 1884 Uncle Nearest. So um, typically when you're making cocktails, you're going to start with the cheapest ingredient in case there is a spillage or anything like that to happen. So we're going to go ahead and start with our sour mix. This um, sour mix is um, not a traditional sour. So typically sours will have a lot of sweetener added to it. So that way it takes away the bite of the sour. But we have that sweetness with um, our here, which really complements the nice flavors of Uncle Nearest. And then we have our jigger here. This is a um, half ounce to one and a half ounce jigger. There are many different types of jiggers. Um, you can Japanese jiggers, their bell jiggers, and that whole sort of thing. So they will be, but we've got our one or one and a half, and then our half here. So this cocktail calls for two ounces of the sour. So we're going to fill up the one and a half and our half. Save this for our second cocktail. And then we've got one ounce of our simple. Okay. And two ounces of our Uncle Nearest. So whiskey sours, traditional cocktail. They've been around since 1862, I believe was the first time they were ever on record. And they were traditionally made with an egg white. Since then, that was taken away because the egg white kind of scared people, but I think it's really nice to try not to get creative with it. You can add an egg white to it. Um, it really frosts up the cocktail and helps cut the acidity a little bit. All right, let's see what the easiest way of. I might just use my hands because I'm making this cocktail for myself, but we'll see how this works. Um, with whiskey sours, you're gonna wanna shake them vigorously. If you don't have a cocktail shaker with you, you can use a mason jar. Ronica and I were talking about that earlier. Just something that has a lid to it. You can use a water bottle, anything you can shake your cocktail in. Okay. 
All right, and then we're gonna dump it into our rocks glass. I got this rocks glass um, from the Miracle Bar at the Overlook today, which was where we were passing out the um, cocktail kits. If you're interested in that, then you can head to their website and maybe make a uh, reservation there. But then we've got our smoked bitters, so I'm gonna put them on top. And I don't know if you can see that from there, but there's a couple dots on top. It's kind of fun, festive, but you should get that smoky aroma right when you take a sip of your cocktail. Cheers. Cheers. Delicious. Thank you, Erin, for that cocktail. Um, so, you know, as we move into this conversation, we also really want to introduce you guys to Uncle Nearest and really kind of talk about the history and what it is all about. So with that, I would like to tap in Victoria um, and really kind of get a sense of, for those who do not know, what is the story behind Uncle Nearest? Good evening, everyone, and thank you for allowing me the opportunity to share with you tonight. I really, really appreciate the invitation. So for those who don't know, Nearest Green is the once enslaved man who taught Jack Daniel how to distill. He is known for perfecting the Lincoln County process. It is the process of dripping of whiskey through sugar maple, sugar maple charcoal. And we believe that Nearest uh, brought that um, over from, from our people in West, West Africa as they um, use that process to uh, purify water, we believe he, he thought in his, in his infinite wisdom that if it worked to purify water, then surely it must work to um, smooth out some of the harshness that was in whiskey, especially back in those days. So how this all unfolded, um, uh, it started in 2016, far as our brand goes. Um, Fawn Weaver, our CEO and founder, read the story of Near Screen and Jack Daniel in the New York Times. Um, the caption, I think, read something about Black man teaches um, uh, Jack Daniel how, how to make whiskey. And so um, Fawn being a historian and a published author uh, herself, uh, she was intrigued by the story and she wanted to know more about this black man who taught Jack Daniel how to make whiskey. So she got on a plane, she and her husband, and headed to Lynchburg. Um, she convinced her husband to take her to Lynchburg for her 40th birthday. And so they arrived in Lynchburg with the intent um, on gathering information to possibly write a book and maybe one day even do a movie. But uh, Fawn was in Lynchburg for about 30 minutes and a phone call was made from the Moore County Library where she had set up to, uh, to do her research. The librarian made a phone call to one of Jack Daniel's descendants. She came to the library and met the Weavers and um, you know, she basically wanted to know, you know what they were doing. Uh, at that time, there was a lot of bad press going around about Jack Daniel. Um, most of it, in fact, you know, was untrue. And so naturally his descendant was concerned that, that Fawn was there in Lynchburg to uh, further uh, the untruths about Jack Daniel and his relationship to, um, to Nearest Green. Well, Fawn spoke with her and uh, put her mind at ease letting her know that um, she would, really wasn't interested in Jack Daniel, that she wanted to know more about Near Screen. And so uh, during the course of the conversation, Jack Daniel's descendant was uh, put at ease and, and in turn um, introduced her to Sherry Moore, who was also a descendant of Jack's. And uh, at the time, Sherry had retired from Jack Daniel uh, she was the um, director of whiskey operations for Jack and had retired after 31 years of service and she was selling real estate. And um, 
the Weavers met Sherry and in fact told her that the farm where Nears Green and Jack Daniel met was actually for sale. And so on the third day that they were in town, um, they made an offer and um, bought the farm. Uh, little did, did we know, or, or anyone really at that time, that that farm, the Dan Call farm, um, was in fact the place where Nears and, and Jack met, but it's also the place of the original old number seven of Jack Daniel Distillery. So uh, Nears Green is there uh, on the Dan Call farm um, uh, working for Dan Call. Uh, Dan Call was a Baptist preacher, but he was also making whiskey. And Nears Green is the man who was distilling for him. So Jack Daniel comes to, the, to live at the Dan Call farm when he was around eight or nine years old. He's curious about what's going on um, in a distance from the house. Um, and finally, Dan Call takes him to meet Nears Green. And he introduces Jack Daniel uh, to Nears Green, telling Jack, a young Jack at the time, um, that Nears Green was the best whiskey maker around. And so um, Jack takes, uh, Nears takes Jack under his wing. He mentors him, teaches him everything he knows about distilling. And um, as years pass, and of course they bro both grow older, uh, Dan Cole decides to get out of the whiskey business. Uh, he was being pressured from his uh, folks in his congregation and also from his wife. Uh, and so he sells the distillery to, to, to Jack Daniel. And Jack asks Nears to stay on with him. And Nears becomes Jack Daniel's first master distiller. And he is indeed the first um, black master distiller on record. Now, fast forward to 2016, and here is Fawn Weaver putting all of this together and uh, meeting all of Jack's family, meeting all of my, my family, Near Screen's descendants. And she learns more about the story than what anyone knew. Um, as I said, she learned that that is the original spot for Jack Daniel's old number seven. And as she begins to piece the story together, she realizes that Near Screen was indeed um, a very integral uh, factor in making Jack Daniel whiskey. And so she goes about um, continuing her research and meeting with Nearest's descendants. And during the course of one of those meetings, um, she asked the question, so how would you guys like to see Nearest's legacy um, cemented in history? And one of the descendants says, we would like to see his name on a bottle. And um, Fawn went about doing just that. Uh, Sherry Moore had uh, told Fawn that if she in fact decided to make whiskey that she would come out of retirement and help her do so. And so Fawn made a call to Sherry Moore and um, a lady with 31 years of whiskey experience um, who hired the last two master distillers at Jack Daniel. So she had a wealth of knowledge um, in, her, in her brain there, and uh, Fawn trusted her to, to uh, come aboard with us, and Sherry graciously did that. And so they went about um, forging this brand, and now we are here in 2020, and we are the fastest growing American spirit in history. We are the best whiskey and bourbon, for 2019 and 2020. We are the only distillery who um, celebrates and honors a black man. And we are the only distillery who is owned and led by a black female. We also have a uh, minority, minority female board. All women uh, serve on our executive board and um, I am happy to be a part of that. Now, I came on the team uh, in March of 2019. And in May of 2019, 
I curated the first batch of 1884. Um, our consumers, our whiskey family, um, they, they, they loved it right out the gate. And we started winning awards with it. And um, uh, we were just thrilled that, that they have, had received it you know, so well. And so I um, curated the next batch. And by uh, November, November 1st of 2019, I was elevated to, um, to Master Blender. And I am the first um, African-American female Master Blender on record. So um, our, our team works hard. Um, we go at, at an accelerated pace but we do so with excellence. Everything is well thought out. Um, prior to putting it in motion, um, the plan has been um, uh, thought out well and all that's left to do is execute it. So while we run fast, uh, we make sure that um, our I's are dotted and T's crossed before it hits the market. So um, I, I know I shared a lot, uh, our story is is uh, is vast and it's a lot to it, but um, in the essence of time, that is that is it in a nut in a nutshell. Um, I am thrilled to to be a part of the team. I am honored that um, Fawn Weaver um, assembled such a dynamic um, team that you would think that they too are Near Screen's descendants. Um, they are all vested in the mission of securing his legacy. And I am just grateful and honored to be a part of that. Oh yeah, that's great. Um, I think it's such an incredible story. It's so awesome that you guys are winning so many awards. Um, what, what does it mean to be a master blender? I know you've used that term a lot with yourself and talking about nearest green, but what does that can you explain, break that down for people a little bit? Uh, yeah, uh, what, what my role is, what it encompasses as far as our 1884 is I am responsible for uh, what's in the bottle, for high taste, um, the, the coloration. We uh, ensure that it's 93 proof. Um, according to the records that, that we have, nearest put whiskey in a barrel around 95, 90, 95 proof. And so we landed on the uh, sweet spot of 93. Um, and the 1884 is the expression that is closest um, to what Nears did all those years ago. You've spoke about being a Nears descendant, um, but you also held a, a your career as an analytical manager with the Department of Justice uh, prior to this shift. So, so what kind of made you be interested in this and, and come aboard um, to this career choice? Well, I mean, th that was a, a, an easy, easy choice. Uh, I'm continuing my, my family's legacy. Um, so uh, I've always known the story. Um, none of us uh, growing up, my, my siblings and I, uh, even my grandmother, I don't think anyone knew until 2016 the magnitude that that Nearest uh, contributed to the spirits industry. And once Fawn um, and the researchers that she, that she assembled put all of that together, um, I, I mean, it's just, it, it, it's, it's a no brainer, you know. Um, there is very few people and none that I know of that have the opportunity to um, reactivate a legacy that lay dormant for more than 160 years. So having the opportunity to um, pick that up and continue it um, now, um, it's, it, you know, I, I, I just can't explain what that means. Yeah, no, I think, I think a lot of people really appreciate what you guys are doing and, and really refocusing on that story and that, you know, that black innovation that is so, oftentimes overlooked in history. Um, and you've talked, you've mentioned it a little before, but can you talk a little bit too about the Nearest Green Foundation and what that role that really means to people? Absolutely, when I came on to the team, um, that was my primary role was to uh, oversee the Nearest Green Foundation. 
prior to um, the brand being la launched, um, Fawn initiated uh, and put into place the Near Spring Foundation. And that foundation was started to, um, to assist in, in furthering the education of Nearest's descendants who had a desire for higher learning. Uh, we will pay for tuition and books for all of Nearest's descendants all the way through um, to their PhD if they so desire. That is, that is really, really awesome. And um, I also know too, you guys are starting up a new scholarship program. Is that correct? There's some, there was a new initiative launched this year. It is the Nearest and Jack initiative. And it was put into place to um, undergird those people of color who have a desire to be in the spirits industry. Um, for people who, who have a desire to uh, work on the executive level um, in the spirits industry. We, we, um, we found that, that uh, the majority of the uh, distilleries and, and those in, in the spirits industry um, were, were mostly white men. And so um, Fawn fought to, um, sought out to change that. And in doing so, uh, the people at Jack Daniel wanted to, uh, wanted to be a part of that. And so it became the Nearest and Jack initiative and it is offered at Motlow State Community College. That is amazing. That is really, really great. Um, we have had a couple of questions come in through the chat. Um, and one of them I think is really an important distinction to make uh, prior to, you know, to our tasting that we will do um, at the end of this conversation. But can you explain a little bit what the difference is between the 1884 and the 1856 Yes. Varieties. The major difference is the years um, that it's aged and the proof. The 1884 is a seven year blend and it is 93 proof. Our 1856 is um, the, the expression that we launched our brand with in 2017. It is 100 proof and it's eight to 14 year old whiskey. People also want to know, is there any publication about this history out since it is such a great story um, to be told and to learn about? Are you saying a book? Any to a book, um, resources out there that people could further access? Everything is on our website. Okay. Everything um, from how, how we started to um, the explanation about all of our expressions, all of that can be sent, found on our website. Uh, do you guys have any new master blendings in the work for 2020 and beyond? Um, <laughs> if I did, I wouldn't tell you. You're gonna <laughs> I have to figure that. <laughs> <laughs> when I, I kind of figured that we one. Can't, we, can't, we, can't, we can't unleash anything with, 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 as yet. But you know us. Um, we are a, a, a team, again, that, that moves very quickly. Um, and if there is something coming down the pike, um, just keep your ears open and eyes open um, at our website. We, we announce everything you know, on our website, on our Facebook page, and through Instagram. Because since 2016 up to now, how many different blends have you guys embarked on? We have three expressions. We right. have the eight, 1856 that we launched with in 2017. And then we have the 1884, that's the small batch that launched in 2019. And then of course we have our 1820, which is the single barrel. Um, and it can only be purchased at the distillery. It is barrel proof whiskey. Uh, the proofs vary. We typically do not um, bottle below 108 proof. What do you recommend to people, especially people that are maybe really interested in supporting this company, this mission, but maybe don't know how, how they like whiskey or how they like bourbon? What is something that you suggest for them um, that they can kind of tip, dip their toes in to say for the, for the bourbon? <laughs> well, well, I suggest starting with the 1884 because it is, it's, it's like light, lighter body and it's a lower proof. 
Um, and if they, uh, you know, if someone is a, has been drinking um, other spirits um, and say they like cranberry juice with it or they like uh, a ginger ale, you drink it how you like it. Um, there is no hard and fast rule in regards to how you enjoy a good glass of, of whiskey. Um, just drink it how you like it. You know, my, my mood and, and, and the environment kind of dictates how I drink mine. Um, I, I like it neat, but I also um, really love a good cocktail. And um, I, I think that a, a lot of women starting out in the, um, with whiskey, a good, a good cocktail um, is a good way to, to ease them into it or introduce them into drinking whiskey. Um, we have several recipes uh, of, of really delicious cocktails on our website. Um, I suggest that you try them. Uh, when making cocktails, um, I'm a firm believer that fresh ingredients um, are the best. Uh, when, 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 say, you use lemon juice, uh, don't use that stuff that's on the shelf in the in the supermarket. Get you a fresh lemon, you know, and squeeze the juice out of it. Um, the 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 fresh ingredients, um, you know, marry well with with whiskey instead of using stuff that's concentrated. And you mentioned the visitor center uh, or the, the the distillery. Does it have? Is the visitor center open right now? And that no. Is Okay. Unfortunately, we are still closed because of COVID. Um, uh, you know, the, the world has gone backwards in regards to the numbers. Um, and so we, we are being very, very careful in regards to um, visitors and, of course, the staff as well. So um, we will not reopen until the numbers are better. And it will likely, for us, be uh, spring of 2021 before we open our door to um, to serve the public again. You know, as we're coming here virtually, um, I think <laughs> I think we can all understand. Uh, you know, the the challenges that we've been faced with with this pandemic. Um, yeah, it has it has definitely been challenging. Um, we start we we broke ground um, at the distillery on September the fifth, 2019. Um, the week after that, we started having hard hat construction tours um, every weekend. And every weekend, we had sold out tours up until we closed the, um, the distillery the second week of March. And so, you know, it's been a long time since we've had the opportunity to welcome um, our whiskey family um, onto the property. But we have, uh, we've made good of, of, of that time. Um, like everyone, we, we, we pivoted to a virtual format, of course, like tonight. But our, our distillery turned into a shipping um, location, so to speak. So um, Fawn, our CEO um, and founder, um, was a little bit ahead of the curve in regards to uh, preparing us for what for what was likely to happen. And so she, she made sure that the team was equipped with, with, with N95 masks before the world went crazy. And then um, when she saw that um, people on the front lines were not being properly equipped with, 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 with PPE, she um, sought to purchase uh, PPE for those frontline workers. Now, granted, we thought it might be a, a thousand people or so at first, and then it turned in sending out about a thousand a day to answering a thousand requests a day. And um, now we have sent out well over 300 pieces, and we still will supply them if we get it, you know, if we get in a request to do that. So we pivoted from concentrating really on, on whiskey to becoming our brother's keeper. And so um, we try very hard every day to live out our, our motto of being more than whiskey. And never before, you know, um, this pandemic has it rang true. Now, um, our mission, of course, is to ensure that Near Screen's name is 
is never ever forgotten again. But when you see people are hurting and, and um, they are not being fully equipped with what they need and, and trying to work through this pandemic, um, we are very happy and, and, um, and glad that our team pitched in and was able to, to fill a need. And we still, we still will do that. Yeah, no, that's that's really that's really great that you guys have been able to make that pivot and have been there for the community. Um, it's obviously so critical right now. It is. It really is. Um, one of the the questions I have gotten in from the chat is, when establishing Uncle Nearest, what was the biggest challenge that you all were faced with? Um. You know, I don't want to speak out of turn for Fawn in regards to what she may say the biggest challenge. Um, I, I, oddly enough, I, I, you know, it has been a lot of work um, putting this, putting this um, brand together. And when it first started, it was literally a handful of people. And so I, I, I would think that the, the, the biggest challenge was um, getting people to understand that what what was being told was absolutely the truth and that that the team was doing it with a handful of people um you know our story is is um um emotional and um it, it is history uh but what i want people to know more than anything is that it's all true it is not embellished um when when we speak it we are speaking truth and so I, I would venture to guess that one of the things was making people understand that it is, it was indeed the truth, you know, what was being, being told. Um, the, 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 the spirits industry as a whole, um, the, the, the people who have gravitated to our brand um, have done so with, um, with open hearts. I think that um, while it has been a lot of work, uh, it's gratifying work. And so, I, I, you know, I, I can't say that it was a lot of, of um, hurdles to cross other than um, getting the story out there, raising the capital, capital to make it happen, and then assembling a team that would be um, committed and dedicated to the, to the mission of, of, of ensuring that Nearest's name was cemented in history. To piggyback off of that, um, what is it a challenge for the Jack Daniels company to reconcile the truth about the history of Nearest, to your knowledge? Uh, you'll have to ask those folks at Jack that. Um, I, I, I don't, I, I, I can't answer that for you. Uh, I, I do know that when, um, during, during Jack Daniels Watch, Nears Green was spoke of uh, at the distillery, uh, during, during um, Jack's, Jack Daniels' descendants, while they were still um, at the ham of the company, uh, Nears was spoke of. Uh, for whatever reason, at, at some point in time, the story went missing. So. That's a question you'll have to ask those folks at Jack. <laughs> we will uh, definitely um, table that one uh, if I ever get on the line with them. <laughs> um, people also want to know, are there investment opportunities with the company and to help out? Well, right now there isn't. Um, uh, I don't, I don't to, to my knowledge, we are, not, um, we are not seeking any capital right now. Uh, naturally, we do have investors. Uh, and Fawn uh, even reached out during the course of this pandemic to, um, to, to ask for um, capital to help us in regards to supplying the PPE. Um, but I don't, um, we do not have an active uh, investment opportunity right now. To kind of wrap things up a little bit, and I will also, you know, we're, Ronica is going to lead us into a um, tasting after this, but um, just to let everybody know if they want to continue asking questions um, in the chat, we'll go ahead and make sure there's time at the end. But 
what is on the horizon for Uncle Nearest? I know we've talked about a lot of things tonight that you guys, all these initiatives that you guys are doing to, you know, as you said, that to be more than whiskey. But is there anything that we haven't, we haven't talked about or that is on the horizon for Uncle Nearest you would like people to know about? Well, you know, um, again, we are here to ensure that Nearest Green is never, ever forgotten, that um, people know who he is and what he contributed. Uh, the Lincoln County process, the process of dripping um, whiskey through sugar maple, maple charcoal was something that, that, that Nears perfected. And it became law in the state of Tennessee in 2003 that if, in fact, you want to be labeled a Tennessee whiskey, that you have to, um, that your whiskey has to go through that process. So I, you know, we, we want people to know that what Nears contributed all those years ago is in fact alive and well today. Um, and then the other thing is when people talk about um, those, those icons in, in the spirits industry like Jim Beam and, and, and of course Jack Daniel and George Dickel, those guys who have been around for years and years and years, we want in the future that when folks have that conversation that near screen is also included. So we work hard every day. Um, we pound the rock every day to ensure that uh, we share the story uh, more and more and that um, people come to know who Nearest is, what he contributed, and why we do what we do. Well, thank you. And like I said, at this point, I think we are going to tap in Ronica, who is going to lead you through a tasting and talk a little bit more about the different varieties. Take it away, Miss Ronica. Great. Victoria, thank you so much for being here. Katie, thanks for having us. I'm excited to be here with you all tonight, talk a little bit about whiskey. If I sound a little... Uh, teary-eyed I am. I do this work every single day and uh, having conversations and listening to Victoria talk and, uh, and just reliving the story of Near Screen still makes me emotional every single time we talk about it. So I'm extremely honored to be a part of the Nearest Green family and I'm um, excited to be here with you. So we're going to taste through uh, the two ex expressions that are available here in Ohio. We are going to, going to start with the Uncle Nearest 1884. So for those of you that are following along at home, feel free to grab that. Hopefully you were able to pick up a bottle. Um, 1884, as Victoria told you earlier, is going to be a seven-year aged whiskey blend uh, coming in at 93 proof. So 1884 symbolizes the year that Nearest Green retired from distilling. So Nearest Green, um, as Victoria told you earlier as well, was the first official master distiller for the Jack Daniels Distillery. In 1884, they had outgrown that space on the Dan Call Farm where they were distilling, distilling at Old Distillery Number 7 and moved to where they are currently. And at that time, Nearest Green did decide to retire uh, in 1884. His three sons continued to work for the Jack Daniels Distillery at that time. And actually, there hasn't been a moment in history that a descendant of Nearest Green has not worked for the Jack Daniel Distillery. So they have always been a huge part of the success uh, and history of that brand as well. But that is what 1884 commemorates, is his retirement year. And these small batch whiskeys are, of course, uh, masterfully blended by Victoria E.D. Butler herself. So uh, you are getting to taste one of her wonderful creations here. And if you have the privilege of having a bottle in front of you right now. You'll see she has her signature on the back that says that this particular bottle was blended by her. So for those of you who haven't done whiskey tastings before, um, we're gonna go through a few different steps in tasting the whiskey. And um, what I'm saying is a suggestion, what I smell and what I taste or what I smell and taste. If you smell and taste something different, that is wonderful. We all smell and taste differently. So there are no wrong answers in whiskey tasting and in what you get from whiskey. So if I'm saying some things that you don't smell or you don't taste, that's perfectly normal. If I'm in space, I'll typically allow you to tell me what you smell and taste instead of the other way around. So that way you can really experience it with, without suggestion. 
but virtually that's a little hard to do. So I'm going to kind of talk about my experiences with the whiskey. But when you taste whiskey, um, the first thing you want to do is just kind of take a look at it. So if you've got your whiskey in a glass, just kind of hold it up to the light. And you want to kind of just assess the color of the whiskey. And that really gives you a really great indication of the age of the whiskey. So Tennessee whiskey is a bourbon. So to be a Tennessee whiskey, you have to meet all legal requirements to be a bourbon. Plus you have to go through one additional step. And that one additional step is the Lincoln County process that was perfected by Nearest Green. And as Victoria was talking about earlier, that step is the filtration of the whiskey after it goes out of the still and before it hits the barrel through charred sugar maple trees. So that is the distinguishing factor, short of location, of course, that allows a Tennessee whiskey to be a Tennessee whiskey. And the reason I bring this up is one of the legal requirements of bourbon is that you can't add anything to your whiskey. So all of that great color you see in your whiskey, Tennessee whiskeys um, and bourbons, comes from the aging process. There isn't anything added. So when you take a peek up in the light and you see the color of the whiskey here, we've got kind of a, a light hay color, straw, um, medium, a medium toned whiskey, which is indicative of a seven year aged whiskey, right? So you can really tell the age of a whiskey by the color. So you always want to take a look. And secondly, you want to kind of see how the whiskey sticks to the side of your glass. And those are called the legs, right? Same as wine, if you're familiar with wine tasting. And those legs are going to kind of give you an indication of the mouthfeel of that whiskey. So it kind of tells you if it's going to be an oily feel or more of a watery feel on your mouth. Um, and this one, you can see, gives a nice thick leg coming down and dripping down the side of the glass. And I think that you're going to find when you taste it that you really feel it in your mouth as opposed to um, it kind of disappearing quickly. So second thing you want to do is you want to give it a smell. And when you smell whiskey, you want to always smell with your mouth open. And that allows you to really smell all of the different nuances. Your olfactory is kind of work together. So by keeping your mouth open, it allows that air to circulate all the way through and allows you to smell the great nuances of the whiskey. So give your whiskey a smell. You can kind of take it back and forth, left to right, up in the center. Uh, you don't want to stick your nose down in the glass. Um, and like I said, keep your mouth open or you only will smell ethanol. Uh, I've been on a drinking hiatus all of November, so I'm very, very excited to be, to be back in my tasting and, and <laughs> smelling of whiskey. This is wonderful. Okay, so on the 1884, um, I'm going to get some vanilla on this one. And I personally get some baking spices, um, almost like an oatmeal raisin cookie. Uh, so you're getting kind of those fun, you know, sometimes you don't know what you're smelling and you have to kind of associate, right? So maybe you're smelling cinnamon and maybe you're smelling nutmeg or clove and you can't pick those scents out, but you know it smells like a cookie or it smells like, you know, your grandmother baking at Christmas, whatever that is, go with that and then kind of take it backwards and say, why, you know, where am I getting those, those smells from or those flavors from? So from this one, I get oatmeal raisin cookie. And if I take that backwards, you know, I'm getting some baking spices. So I think that's kind of a fun aroma that we get from the 1884. And of course that vanilla from that nice American oak. Um, next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna give it a taste. So when you taste whiskey, for the first time, I'm gonna assume, first time today, your mouth needs to acclimate, right? So give it a little taste and kind of swish it around. Let your mouth and your taste buds acclimate to the fact that you're putting whiskey in, especially 93 proof, right? And then we're gonna take a second drink. And that's where we're really gonna be able to assess what those flavor profiles are in the whiskey because uh, our mouth won't be quite as shocked. So give it a small taste. And kind of chew it a little bit. And if you can, open your mouth a tiny bit when you swallow it. Again, your olfactories work in a way that if you allow your mouth to be open a little uh, as you're swallowing, that air can circulate all the way through and it allows you to taste those nuances and flavor profiles of the whiskey a little bit better. So give it a second taste. Allow it to really coat your mouth. The baking spices come out really, really great in this one. Um, I still get the vanilla. I get a little bit of citrus personally in 1884, which is why 1884 is my favorite 
to make sours with. Mm. New York sours specifically, which is a whiskey sour topped with red wine. Earlier, Katie was asking, how do you suggest that you know one drink whiskey if you're new or it's something that you're not used to? And of course, drink whiskey how you like whiskey. But anytime I'm talking to a group who may be new at whiskey um, or a group of wine lovers, I always suggest 1884 in a New York sour because you've got that whiskey sour, so you've got that simple syrup, that lemon juice on that whiskey, and then you're topping it with a nice red wine. I like big, bold Cabernets with mine. And it really allows you to introduce whiskey in a way that's familiar, right? So people know red wine, maybe, and they don't know whiskey. So by combining those two things together, that red wine really kind of brings out some of those kind of baking spice and vanilla notes usually in the whiskey, uh, counteracts really nice with the sweetness of the sour um, and really introduces whiskey in a way that allows people who aren't familiar with it to associate it with something they are, are familiar with and then kind of transition from there into drinking it neat or you know, in some more whiskey forward cocktails. So 1884 is my favorite to pair with citrus-based cocktails um, specifically. So I only brought one glass, so I'm gonna finish this real quick and then we'll move on to the 1856. Okay. And the New York Sour, Veronica, is a very easy cocktail to make too. So easy. And what's so just- So easy. It's so great. I mean, I use it a lot in cocktail demos for that very reason. It's just so simple. Yes. It's a few ingredients with a little red wine on top. It's personally my favorite cocktail it and so I drink it at home a lot because it's just so easy. It's yes. four ingredients, um, including the whiskey, doesn't really, and it's very forgiving. It doesn't really matter how much simple you add or how yes. much lemon juice or how much red wine, just kind of throw it all together and it's delicious yes. no matter what you do. Yes. So that's one, of, that's one of the great things about it for sure. Okay, so we're gonna move on to 1856. This is our flagship product. Uh, 1856 would be the year that Nearest Green perfected what we know as the Lincoln County process. Um, so we commemorate that date here with our flagship bottle. Uh, this one's gonna be eight to 14 year age. So this is our premium product. Uh, coming in at 100 proof. Sounds scary, I know. It's not. You're going to be shocked when you drink it at how not scary it is for 100 proof. So as Victoria was talking earlier, our director of operations, Sherry Moore, um, who is a chemist by trade, so she has lots of really great secrets up her sleeve. Uh, but one of the things that we do with our product, uh, which is unique in the world of whiskey to my knowledge, is that after barreling and before bottling, we do a carbon filtration process through charred coconut shells. And Charred coconut shells, while being way more expensive, uh, is way more effective in our opinion and, and really, really kind of mellows out the finish of the whiskey. And I think you see that in both expressions, but specifically in the 1856 being 100 proof, you know, think about all of your bottled and bond whiskeys and kind of how they finish on your palate and compare that to what you're about to taste. And I think you'll really notice a difference. And I personally attribute that to that finishing process uh, through that carbon filtration. So I'm gonna try the 1856 now. We're gonna go through the same process we went through before. So we're gonna kinda hold it up to the light, give it a look. You notice that we've now moved to a dark amber, right? So we've moved from that kind of straw hay to a dark amber. And of course, we're, we're eight to 14 year aged here instead of the seven year. So the longer that that whiskey sits in that barrel, the more opportunity it has to get those deep dark colors. So to be a Tennessee whiskey, like I said, you have to first meet all the requirements to be a bourbon. And one of those requirements is that you must be aged in a charred American oak barrel. And by charred, what we mean is we take the inside of the barrel and we light it on fire, right? And so think about your bonfire or your fire pit. When you light that wood on fire, Mind you, we're doing it for 30, 45 seconds minimum, or you know, maximum in the whiskey world, but it's a really intense fire. So it's giving you the inside of that barrel, that same look you would see in your fire pit. When you catch it on fire and your wood starts to kind of get all of those little crevices in it, right? 
those little burnt crevices. Same thing on the inside of a whiskey barrel. So the longer it sits in that barrel, the more opportunity it has to kind of get in and out of those burnt crevices, which gives more opportunity for it to get deeper and deeper in color because it goes into the barrel clear, of course. So the deeper it is, the you know, longer it typically has been aged. So we're getting that dark amber color. Again, the legs here are really nice and thick, uh, super heavy. And I think that you'll notice that the 1856 has a really, really great mouthfeel, uh, super silky, super smooth. So let's give it a smell. And remember, keep your mouth open when you're smelling whiskey. That vanilla has changed to caramel. And those baking spices have become very, very intense. Um, I get a lot of cinnamon, a lot of clove, a lot of nutmeg on this. I've backed away from smelling any of those citrus notes that I get in the 1884. So I think as we've aged a little higher, you know, those flavor profiles from that caramel and those baking spices have become more intense. I also get a little bit of stone fruit uh, in the 1856 that I don't personally get in the 1884. Um, let's give it a taste. So delicious. I never am sad about an opportunity to drink 1856. So mm -hmm. I'm getting a ton, a ton of cinnamon on this one, a ton of baking spices. Um, caramel almost to maple, personally, on the sweetness. Um, it, it really has developed in the taste profile on the 1856 for me. I like to drink 1856 just like it is. Now, I always always recommend you drink whiskey exactly how you like to drink whiskey, but I also always recommend before you determine how you like to drink it, drink it exactly the way it comes out of the bottle. Yes. Taste it first. Yes. Yeah, taste it. You got to taste how it, it was first. Designed. Yeah. Yeah. And then you can determine what you want to do with it. Maybe you want to add a drop of water. Maybe you want to add an ice cube. Maybe you want to throw it in a cocktail, but I don't think that you should do anything to any whiskey until you've at least had a taste of it exactly as it was intended by the distiller or the blender or the maker straight out of the bottle. So I really love 1856 neat, but I also really love 1856 in an old fashioned. Um, I think, you know, old fashions are kind of my favorite thing to play with. Um, and for those of you who don't know, an old fashioned is basically whiskey, sugar, and bitters, right? So super, super easy. And the thing I really love about old fashions is you can make them in any flavor combination that you want just by changing the flavor of the bitters and changing the flavor of the sugar, otherwise known as simple syrups, uh, which you can make in every flavor possible. So I make a ton of old fashions at home um, and I play with the flavors of those two things and you have a completely different cocktail every time. But 1856 has enough robustness to it that it always shines through those bitters and those sugars it's where you can really taste the spirit. And I really appreciate that. So I always use 1856 and more spirit forward cocktails specifically uh, in my old fashions. Um, but yeah, so those are our two expressions that are available in Ohio. If you go to unclenearest.com, you can type in your zip code and find your product. Um, and it will tell you where in the state you can purchase both of these. They're coming in currently at $39.99 for the 1884. $49.99 for the 1856 retail um, and available in almost 300 different uh, liquor stores throughout the state of Ohio. So plenty available. Uh, please take a look, get out there, buy yourself some bottles. Um, and while I'm still here, I just want to thank Erin from Foxtails who uh, made the cocktail kits and curated the cocktail for us this evening. It was amazing and I appreciate you. And also wanna thank the Overlook Lodge uh, who allowed us to use their space for cocktail kit pickup tonight. And if you're looking for something fun um, and safe to do for the holiday, please check out the Miracle uh, Christmas Experience at the Overlook Lodge. Um, they've got lots of really cool, fun things going on there. So definitely take a peek. Um, and for those of you who follow along with cocktail kits um, or cocktail ingredients, find me on Instagram at Whiskey Woman, woman with an X. So Whiskey Woman, W-O-M-X-N, and share your cocktail kit with me, please, your creations. Um, and that's a really great place to follow me here in Ohio as well. 
to know what's going on in Ohio and kind of some of the happenings uh, with Uncle Nearest here um, and some of the fun things we have going on, of course, uh, through the month of December for the holidays. So I appreciate uh, you all being here and hopefully you enjoyed uh, being able to spend time with Miss Victoria tonight and with Erin um, with our cocktails. So I'll turn it back over to you, Katie. Yeah, no, I just wanted to echo um, our thanks from the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center for being a part of this, you know, this conversation, sharing this really impactful and important history with everybody. Um, it's such a great story. It's holiday time. This is something that I think we can all feel good about supporting. Um, and I think it's always fun to, you know, drink a little bit whiskey um, <laughs> in the process. Um, and I just want to... Right. And I just wanted to mention too, the comment section is just loaded with people saying how much the story impacted them, how touched they are by this experience, how much they loved the cocktails, Erin. Um, so again, thank you. Um, and I just, again, want to thank all three of you for participating in this conversation tonight and for being with us. Um, and to thank everybody to our virtual visitors who have signed on to this. We are going to be doing more virtual programs in 2020 and 2021. Um, so follow us on our website, which is freedomcenter.org and our social media handles. Um, and you can always click to donate to our COVID-19 relief fund. So again, thank you to everybody. Um, enjoy this holiday season and have a great evening. Thank, thank you. So thank you so much, Katie. Thanks. Have a great night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Thanks, Veronica. Thank you, Victoria. See you soon.